So welcome to Introduction to R with Statistics, not to be confused with Introduction to Statistics with R. Today, we'll mostly focus on the uh, R programming language as well as the user interface. And then we'll be using some concepts in statistics to walk through uh, the, the, the program itself. Uh, this is not going to be a, a comprehensive uh, introduction to statistics, um, but we will be going be going through some some of the basic topics, but not comprehensive. So I want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, however, uh, because this is a virtual setting, it's a little bit difficult uh, for me to try to get to know everyone and try to answer all the questions. So what I'm going to do is uh, in interval time. Uh, every kind of five, 10 minutes or so, I'll, I'll check the chat just to see if there's any questions. So feel free to put your questions or comments into the chat itself. I think everyone's on mute, so thank you for that. And uh, I think the only rule I'll have for this session is to uh, be respectful, um, but also to kind of have fun and, and share as much as you can. We, we really uh, celebrate the collaborate, collaborative learning experience in this sessions. So agenda for today, I'll just do a quick introduction to the course, uh, and then I'll go right into R and R studios talking about, you know, why R exists and what it's used for. And um, we'll be going through kind of the, the basic interfaces and how do you launch it and, and those kind of things. And then we'll go right into uh, building a R script using basic operators. So operators, mathematics operators, you know, plus minus, multiply, divide, those kind of things. And then we will be using a housing data set that you can find publicly. It's a Boston housing data set uh, that spans about two decades, I think, but uh, for a specific neighborhood. And we'll be using that data set to run some, uh, some what we call EDA, exploratory data analysis. Uh, sometimes we will call it DA, which is discovery analytics. Uh, there's a lot of different names for it. But essentially what that means is whenever you get a data set, uh, the first things you want to do is look at the, the basic structure of it. You know, how many columns, how many variables, how many rows, and what is the different column uh, stand for. So in the data set I, was, uh, I gave to you, it includes also a data dictionary, which is a pretty, pretty good uh, data governance practice. Every data set should come with a data dictionary describing what the data inside us is for. And then finally, if we have time, uh, we'll do a little bit of a prediction. So using regressions and talk about what that is. I'm aiming to have the session finish around 8, 10, 8, 15, and then leave the rest of the time for questions. Um, because, uh, again, this is a virtual setting, I'm not able to actually have everybody follow along uh, in your own kind of R. If you want to try, um, definitely, uh, I would I would encourage it, but I know it is quite difficult to have one screen where the instructor is teaching and another screen, uh, or even split in the screen uh, for something like R. So that's why we're leaving a little bit more time at the end for, for kind of questions. Usually we do these in sessions and it's e easy for me to kind of take five, 10 minutes, walk around and try to fix everybody's code. But um, if there's any kind of problems in general, uh, number one best friend is kind of ask your peers, ask me, but also Google it. More often than that, especially for this class, the, the basic class, it will be a, um, it will be probably be a typo of some sort. So R, for example, is very case sensitive. So if you miss any character here and there, it will actually, uh, the code will not work. So a little bit about me. Um, I think for those of you who's been in these sessions, uh, no, but we have quite a few new people coming in today. So um, education wise, I did three degrees at Western University. I did my undergraduate in business at Ivy Business School the honors specialization in economics, economics, where I focus on micro and macro economics uses of uh, econometrics, which is just a fancy word for statistics for economics. I also did my master's of science in analytics. Um, and just a little bit, I've done a ton of different projects 
in analytics. Um, I started the company, Events Analytics and Research Lab, about four years ago. And for us, it's all about working with different problems. Uh, the more complex, the better, and trying to solve uh, these difficult problems with data and math. In terms of teaching, so I've been teaching statistics, analytics, and economics for about 15, sorry, I think I did the math last, uh, it's about 13 years. So certainly uh, I've taught this session in particular as well, you know, probably more than 10, 20 times. So a little bit more fun stuff about me, uh, if you haven't seen this already. So on the top left, um, it's a picture of me, uh, the cappuccino that I made. So I went to Italy, learn how to make latte art from the person who invented latte art. Uh, ton of fun. In the middle there is me volunteering at Dominican Republic. Uh, top right, uh, it's a picture of the painting that I did. Bottom left, it's uh, me visiting the dinosaur vault at the Royal Ontario Museum. Bit of a dream come true for me. And then bottom right, uh, it's me on a motorcycle racing course. Totally nuts. Um, a little bit about advanced analytics and research lab. Uh, it's kind of just for analytics lab. So we are a hybrid analytics solutions, consulting and services shop. So what that means is uh, we aim to be the fastest and easiest way for any organizations to gain full analytical cap capability. So for the price of one analyst, for example, you can get an entire specialized team. Our education mission uh, is really to make <laughs> statistics and data fun, but also practical enough for everybody to start using uh, in their day-to-day, -day, whether it's in their personal life or in their professional settings. So we're doing a lot of these courses this fall. Uh, so we've done uh, the basic analytics intro. We did a visualization with Excel, another visualization with Click, and an intro with R. We're still kind of planning for the um, uh, courses in November and also for the upcoming winter semesters. Uh, all the profits are donated charities combating uh, COVID-19. So analytics as a toolbox, um, the way we, oh, at least the way I think about analytics is, analytics is really a problem solving methodology, really. Um, so how do you problem solve with facts and numbers and quantitative and qualitative information in general? And itself, it's a framework. So I'm going to teach you as much as the fun foundation and fundamentals as possible. This is this does not replace, you know, a diploma or a university degree. And you can certainly do a university degree on any sort of these specialization in analytics. But I aim to give you the framework, and then hopefully the rest you can learn. Um, especially once you have the, the foundation, you can learn kind of the specifics on your own. So the way I imagine it's like, it's like a toolbox I'm going to give you, but then you have to start adding different tools. So, you know, in the toolbox, you can have a hammer, a screwdriver, a power tool, whatever. And it's each one of those is used for a very specific problem set. And today, one of the tools I'm going to give you is uh, coding in R. So it's a very useful and very powerful tool, especially once you get beyond kind of the basic limitations in Excel and uh, BI tools. So there will be a, a certificate available. So um, you can feel free to add uh, after the course onto your LinkedIn profiles. Uh, I'll send out a whole instruction on how to do that. In terms of uh, just a quick review, uh, I think we went through this in one of the first classes we did, um, but the types of data. So just a really, really high level uh, data scientist version. There's structure versus unstructured data, big versus small data. So structure is anything that you can put into a tabular format, really. So databases, Excel sheet, that's what we call tidy. And unstructured is everything else. And unstructured data, I think it's like, is responsible for like 90, 95% of the data out there. So this could be anything from video, text, uh, images, uh, all those kind of things. But how do you deal with unstructured data? You actually first have to convert them into quantitative and structured data, and then you can try to analyze it. Big versus small data. Uh, there's a very specific definition for big data. 
um, at least industry-wide. But for me, uh, what I would say is anything that you actually can't handle on your ordinary laptop and requires you to be very specific on how you handle the data, I would consider big data. So a typical modern laptop, let's say eight, 16 gigs of RAM, you can probably hang, handle a data set in Excel that's about 500 megabytes to one gigabyte. Beyond that, it gets like really choky and I'm sure some of you have experiences with it, with that. When, when you're using more kind of big data tools, so um, BI and R and Python, in a normal computer, you can maybe handle up to four or five gigs of RAM, uh, sorry, four or five gigs of data set, but beyond that, uh, you really start eating up uh, your, your, your memory and your processing power. Um, and and so I hope some of you understand what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the architecture and hardware side of um, data data science. And then we have the traditional or more statistical look at data. So there's really three main types, cross-section, time series, and panel data. So cross-section is like a snapshot in time. So imagine, for example, a grocery store. As of tonight, how many apples there are? What are the prices? How many bananas? How many oranges? Things like that. Time series, uh, kind of as the name suggests. So it's data across time. So how many apples are sold yesterday, today, tomorrow, and so on. And then panel is really just a combination of those two. And it's actually a very complicated, uh, complicated way to deal with panel data for sure. Um, and then there's actually a lot of other like kind of more technical versions too. So like in databases, for example, there's a ton of different ways to uh, define data, but this is um, more problem solving view, not the technical view of looking at data. So I'll just jump right into R. Uh, okay, just checking for comments, any questions, feel free to post them. Otherwise, I'm going to R. Okay, so programming in R, I'm just going to go through like a quick, I think it's like eight slides on uh, why R exists and and what R is used for. And then we'll just jump straight into the interface. So uh, first off, what, what, is, what is statistics? Um, it's the practice or science of collecting, analyzing, uh, data in large quantities, especially for the purpose of inferring proportions in a whole from those in a sample. So I broke that down in two, right? So first off, um, collecting and analyzing data in large quantities. Um, you know, you can you can do an average of five numbers, but it's probably hard to do an average of a million numbers without getting uh, without using a computer especially for the purpose of inferring proportions uh, in a whole. So this is actually an interesting uh, part of this definition. So historically, data is hard to come by. Even if you talk to someone, you know, 10, 20 years ago, um, if you want to understand any, almost any sort of large quantity of data, usually what you would do is you would take a sample and you would make an inference on the sample to the whole population. So a really good example of that um, census data, right? So um, census data is basically you're, you're trying to understand um, pretty much everybody within you know, a set population. That's in Canada, there's 36 million people. But a better way of, or a more efficient way of doing that is actually randomly select, you know, um, let's say 3 million people instead of 30 million people and say, hey, these 3 million, because the way we we selected these samples randomly, they're actually, the average is actually pretty similar to that of the whole. So let's say you randomly select 3 million people and the average age is uh, 45. And you can actually say, okay, because we did this in a proper statistical method, we can actually infer this and say, okay, the all population is probably around 45 as well. And there's a whole proof, mathematical proof behind that. So nowadays, that's actually a little bit differently. So 
it used to be too costly to collect all the data that's possible. But nowadays, it's actually possible to collect all of the data. So with technology and sensors uh, constantly collecting information and with cheap uh, data uh, storage and with better computation, we're actually able to uh, analyze the information in whole and not just have to take a sample. So this is a whole like advent of big data and data science is, you know, we no longer need uh, to be very clever about using statistics. Now we can what we call brute force and just like use raw computational power to crunch all these numbers, which is uh, which is actually a very interesting uh, topic on its own. So how do you turn data into outcomes? So, um, you know, you start with raw data, right? So any sort of data that's collected, let's say, um, you know, you're working in, I'm just, I'll just go back to the grocery store. Let's say you have raw um, inventory data for the past year, day to day. Then you turn that into some sort of information. So you crunch numbers, do a graph, run some statistics, take some averages, counts, maximums, whatever. Then you use that to derive insights. So with the context, let's say you're a grocery manager and you saw, hey, like how come, you know, Saturday mornings are really low traffic. Okay, then you go dig in deeper into it. Um, you know, okay, let's say, you know, it's low traffic because there is a, there is a, a, a fitness class right next to it. People don't want to <laughs> come during those times because it gets too crazy outside, just making it up, right? So then you can plan for it. Hey, maybe, uh, you promote to that fitness class, tell them to come in afterwards, <laughs> something like that. And you actually act on your plan and you figure out an outcome. Um, you, you found the plan that you hopefully can have some sort of positive outcome. You know, maybe now Saturday mornings, instead of, you know, being very quiet, now it's very busy. So a quick example of that, that I think everybody knows, uh, weather example, uh, weather, right? So everybody, uh, I think for the most part, checks the weather these days. So for the past, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, we've been storing weather information. Then now with statistics and computation, you can say, hey, what is gonna be the future weather, right? Temperature and precipitation, what's the probability of rain? And from that, you can derive some insights. Okay, so I'm going camping this weekend, so rain is bad, then, as a planning, I should prepare a raincoat, I'm doing a raincoat, and it actually rained while camping, but because I brought a raincoat, I didn't, I didn't get wet. So this is one of those like contingency planning part of um, data science. So turning data into decision-making, um, right? So everybody understand information versus data. So information is more contextual. Uh, and in statistics, statistics, we also have probability theory, right? How many, if you roll a dice, what's the probability of it being one versus five and one and two, things like that. Sample versus population we talk about. <clears throat> so a question here, um, now we're getting into a little bit more statistics. That was your five minute <laughs> statistics recap from you know high school or university taken. So can you do an average of five numbers, right? So everybody can probably do that. It's not too hard. You sum all the numbers up and then you divide it by the count of the numbers, which is in this case five. <clears throat> How about trillion numbers, right? So what's the point of statistical programming? It helps us crunch larger data sets. So um, I guess asked this all the time, so I'll just get it out of the way. Um, a lot of people ask me, hey, Eric, now that I've taken this class, how do I, how do I practice? So Number one thing I say is um, to find a data set that you're passionate about. So it could even be your personal data, right? So maybe you can pull your spending data for the past five years on your bank records or something. Um, for me, you know, I have a bunch of weird stuff. Um, I track my, my hours in a day. I track uh, how much, how, how often I brush my teeth using my, my smart toothbrush, which is a little excessive. Uh, and, a, and a ton of other stuff like my, my fitness and all that stuff. But um, if you want to look into other data sets, there's lots of lots and lots of public data sets out there. 
I would say for the most part, if you Google it, you can probably find it these days. Um, for example, if you live in Toronto, you know, we have an open Toronto uh, data portal that the government, uh, the city of Toronto actually has a portal for a lot of city data. So you can look at everything from COVID statistics to uh, Toronto public services. You know, they tell, they, they have everything from like, which intersection has the most uh, like criminal activities down to like traffic violations and things like that. Uh, very fascinating data set. Uh, GitHub has a ton of different data. I have a link here. Um, somebody actually posted a, a huge set of uh, different data sets. Um, US government also has open data. UN has open data. Quando uh, has open data. Uh, well, has a lot of free data, but a lot of them you have to pay for uh, streaming. So Quando uh, has an API for R. So an API is an application program interface. Just imagine it like a pipe you can plug into your computer that has all the data feed that you can get. Uh, and there's a couple of other um, uh, links there. Statistics Canada has a ton of data about Canada, of course. Uh, most of them are in pretty good uh, formats. So what is R? So R is a programming language. Uh, primarily for statistical programming as widely used for data science. And R Studios is a IDE uh, for R, but essentially you can think of it as R is like the engine and R Studio is like the front end user, user interface, like your wheels and your, your brakes and gas and things like that. You can actually use R by itself. You don't actually need R Studios. Well, our studio makes it a lot easier for you to organize your code. It gives you some autocomplete capabilities. It helps you like spot errors. So highly recommend using our studio if you're using R. Uh, I know a couple of old school professors that actually teach us with just R and that's actually a huge struggle. So why is it great? Well, it is, I would say it is one of the most commonly used tool for uh, data science. Uh, it's open source, so it's free. Uh, free is always great. Uh, but why is that Why is that good, right? Community, uh, here to answer all your questions. Uh, there's, especially at the beginning stages, if you have any questions in R, uh, it's pretty easy to just Google it and somebody will have asked the question. You can see the answers. It's got a lot of packages, so R, because it's been around for a long time, um, there's a ton of pre-built uh, code you're able to just call and use. So most common statistical methodologies you can find and the new ones uh, you can also use. Um, I would say most likely some of the newer methodologies in machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, you'll come, up, come out in uh, R and Python uh, fairly quickly. And then uh, some uh, industry call, study calls it mature enough for implementation. So that's this one. Um, so the Gartner hype cycle for data science. So this one is a little bit old. I couldn't really find a new one um, because you need a subscription for it. But essentially uh, Gartner does, does these uh, tool data science tool studies and it talks about all the different methodologies and um, there's a lot of hype around a lot of different uh, tools out there, but a lot of them don't make it past the hype. Only the one that's useful kind of does. And R is actually one of the most uh, mature in terms of tools that's available that's well recognized. It's also got a ton of different packages. So if you want to run cluster analysis, natural language processing, neural networks, uh, VARs, which is uh, vector auto regressions, different ways to interact with data, forecasting with time series, uh, text mining, plotting. Um, there's uh, interactive dashboards. There's there's a ton of different things out there. And you don't have to build it yourself. You just have to call the packages and someone's already done it for you, which is pretty great. Um, so actually, before we jump right into it, I will answer a question that I get asked all the time also, which is uh, why R over Python? So um, 
R and Python are both good. They both do fairly similar things in terms of statistical uh, analysis. Python is a general programming language. So you can use it to do like web development and, and a bunch of other things, whereas statistics, uh, R is built to analyze statistics. So whereas if you want to do prototyping in statistical modeling, if you want to do analysis in, in statistics and data, R is a lot quicker because the, the language and the, the syntax is built for uh, statistics. Python is really good as well, not, not to say it's bad, um, but Python nowadays is uh, also really popular. So most tech companies actually use Python for their data science because when, when tech company uses data science, they're more about integrating their data science techniques, so prediction, optimization into their actual code, whereas R is more for analysis. So the distinction there is Python is more for productization so you can build a uh, data science model that will go into an actual application. Whereas R, generally people say it's better for quick prototyping and analysis and it's quicker. So it's up to you which one you want to choose. Um, we, do, we do courses on R and Python. And um, there's, there's certainly things that R is good for and Python is good for. Uh, so it's a bit of a pros and cons. But I do see, I think, a lot more people are learning Pythons, uh, whereas R is like, still the majority uses R, but Python gets used a lot. And then there's other tools like uh, SPSS, uh, SAS, things like that. Um, that's similar, but don't get used as much. Checking if there's any questions. I think I answered a lot of those, uh, the common questions that's, that gets asked. Great. <clears throat> Sorry, my, um, I had like six hours of meetings today, so my throat is uh, pretty sore. All right, so I'm gonna jump right into uh, R. So when you fire up R, so here's the icon for R Studios you'll come up with uh, these four windows. So mine will probably look a little bit different than yours. So first off, I'm gonna walk through what are these windows and I'll walk through how come mine looks a little bit different. So uh, we have the, uh, the console or the terminal here, which is the actual uh, connection to R in the back end. So as I mentioned, R Studio is the front end and R is the back end. So what R Studio does is everything you type in here gets sent to R and then R sends something back and it shows up here. So here you have the console. So you can type anything you want here. Uh, one plus one, enter, and it'll go into, it'll show you the results. On the left here is the script. So usually it'll be empty. So, you know, it's kind of like a Word document. So you can start writing here and then each script you can turn into like a program. You can run uh, all sorts of automation on this. On the bottom left, we have the environments, which actually talks about what data you have currently loaded into the environment. And on the bottom right here, you have the files, plots, packages. So if you any if you do any plots, you'll show up here. On the top, uh, I'm just going to show a couple of things. So uh, this plus here. Uh, it's basically starting a new script. So right now we're in a new script. Uh, if anyone has taken my previous classes knows I love short keys. So if you do control shift N, you'll actually open a new script. If you go into tools and global option, you'll see a lot of uh, different options. So here um, I always do, for example, a soft wrap. So basically it wraps the text so it doesn't go outside the screen. The scrolling gets kind of annoying. Appearances, so I always say, uh, if you're ever gonna get into programming, uh, and if any one of you here, is, this is your first time programming, uh, congrats. Uh, hopefully after this class, you can you can add programming onto your resume. I always say try to, you always gotta make it look cool, right? If you ever wanna look cool, just go to, maybe not nowadays, but I, I would say go to a Starbucks and run some R code and 
you know, with all these colors, it looks pretty fancy. Um, but I think a lot of the defaults is like these white backgrounds. So that's probably how yours look like. Mine is currently called Dracula, which is, <laughs> I actually didn't even know that. That's, that's a lot of fun. And I'm actually going to just make the font a little bit bigger. So it'll be hopefully easier for everyone to see. And then I also note that I actually switched some of my windows around. So I like having my source call on the left and my, oops, and my console on the right, just so I get more screen real estate when I'm coding. But I think the default is the console is like on the bottom and then the source goes on the, on the top. Okay. Um, yeah, so the first thing we're going to do, just jumping right into it, uh, see if there's any question. Yeah, yeah, uh, Hunan, uh, question. My setup for R is a bit different with the console and environment swap. Is that important that it's different? Yeah, so that that's just a personal preference thing. So I, I have mine on the left and right. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're going to do is actually start a new script. And uh, once you start a new script, essentially you can treat the console like it's instant messaging. So what I mean by that is like if you ever have you know a Google Chat, WhatsApp, Slack, every time you type something and you press enter, you'll get sent. Whereas on the left in the script, it's like writing an email, so you have to write a bunch of stuff and you can run all of it at the same time. So the difference here is like you, you can do one plus one, two plus two, right? So it sits out the answer or you can write it into the script, right? Run plus one, two plus two. It actually doesn't run. For the console to actually run your code, you have to click on the line and you say run and you actually send the code into the console, run, or you can highlight the whole thing and click run. Okay, so um, the first thing we're gonna talk about is uh, commenting. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do uh, if you do a hashtag uh, and you say, this is a R course, R will treat this as a uh, comment. So what that means is that you'll, you'll know this is not an actual code or function, so you won't actually run that line. Okay, so anyone who's taken programming knows uh, the first function we're gonna run with a new, uh, with a new uh, programming language is hello world. So for R, the function is always followed by parentheses and then inside the parentheses is your parameters. So we can do print hello world and you can click on it and you can say run, right? So hello world will run there. And you notice that it doesn't say print or all the other stuff. It just says hello world with a double quote. So this is treated as a text. So anything inside a quotation mark, either double or single, be treated as a text, all right? So you can uh, you can uh, do a short key here as well, Control Enter, and you see how it jumps to the next uh, next line. All right, so then we'll do basic commands, so basic operators rather, so arithmetic, so one plus one, and you see the answer here is two. One times two is two. And then if you do two stars, so uh, if you don't know the star is uh, multiplication, I mean, I think it's true for most things these days, uh, especially in Excel and statistics, because mm -hmm. there's no, the X multiply. Wonder why they teach that in school. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> um, so we have also two, two, uh, to the power of two, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, how come the device sign gets used and we don't have the device sign on the computer either? We have the slash. A little sidetracked here by my own thought. Um, yeah, two star star two is two to the power of two, which is four. Okay. Uh, and just to keep note, uh, you can see here, this uh, title here is a little bit different color because that, because I wrote something into it. So I just, every time I roll something new into it, I just want to save. So what you, what happens is when you save the script, it's basically like a text. So you'll save as a dot, dot R file. 
and basically R just recognizes as a script, but you can it basically look just looks like plain text. So if you go into the actual script itself, um, you can see these are the dot art, the art files. And then if you even just open it up with with a notepad or something, you can see the code is pretty pretty plain. <laughs> All right. Next, we have uh, these uh, lists. So to create a list, we use the C function, which is short for concatenate. Concatenate basically strings up a bunch of things together. So if you run this command, you can see here it's a list one, two, and three. One in the first position, two in the second position, and three in the third position. So then you can do something like this list times two, and you can probably guess the answer is going to be two, four, six. Then you can also assign a variable. So um, any, any string that doesn't get used, you can assign a variable to it. So first off, how do you assign a variable? You use this arrow thing, which is uh, the less than button and then a slash. So you can do uh, x, assign two to x. So you, if I enter that, you can see here, nothing happens, nothing shows, but here you can see x value is two. So then if I call x, then you'll output two. So then y, we have uh, assigning a list one, two, and three, then we call y, then y is one, two, and three. So then if you do x multiplied by y, then you have two, four, six. Then you have some uh, functions, which is uh, what R and I mean programming is all about. So mean of y, so mean of one, two, and three, it's gonna be two. And a quick tip, if you do a question mark and then the function, you'll actually pull up the documentation for it. So I'll just quickly go through this part because it's quite important. So every single function, uh, you'll have the usage, the arguments. So the arguments is the data that goes into the function, what value is spits out, and then some references. Pretty much every single one of these have, a, have some pretty good documentations behind it. And then there's some examples, which is uh, really useful. Okay, and then I think you can also run a double question mark, and that actually pulls up a uh, a different yeah. So that actually pulls up a uh, the online version of the uh, the manual. Cool. Uh, I'll stop and say if there's any questions. Uh, Hunan, uh, one thing I remember about coding is that there's true and false. I try using the add function as true plus true, but, it's, but instead of true, it gave me two. <laughs> true represents one and false is zero. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Jason can do all the teaching here. Um, was there a comment to run previous line from text? Um, when you say previous line, do you mean the previous function that was run? So here's, here's how, I how I interpreted that. So you can click on the, uh, the console and then there's no function, there's nothing here. And then you can actually press up to cycle through the historical functions that have, you have run already. Is that what you mean, Gary? Great, okay. Yeah, and you can always see a list of all the functions you've run just by scrolling up anyways, and you can just like copy and paste it. Um, oh, I'm still here, cool, okay. Um, or uh, actually, interesting to note, you can actually press Control L to clear your space as well. So if it ever gets too messy, you can just clean up any other questions? So much fun. 
<laughs> All right. Part two, using, uh, using statistics uh, with R. So first off, I, use, I always use this function to clear off uh, any sort of data that's loaded into R. So you can see here, right now I have uh, some, some old information in here. So if I run it, all this gets uh, cleared out. So it's kind of like what we call garbage collection. It clears out your, uh, your memory so that you can run your analysis on a clean file. And also sometimes there is a lot of backend connection that's connected that you don't want to screw up or if there's packages that's uh, already been loaded. So how are we going to do the statistics portion? Um, is that we are going to use the data set that I sent off, which is the housing data set. So a quick uh, view on the data set. So the housing training CSV file, this is how it looks like. So essentially, uh, this is what we call tidy format or structure data, right? So ID is essentially each row is a transaction. So each row is a different house and how much, uh, how big it is, so lot area, the street type. We have, I think, 80 variables, the year it was built, overall condition, overall quality, year that's remodeled, blah, blah, blah. And then on the end here, we have the sales price. And we also have years sold. Um, so how much is that? $208,000. So pretty cheap uh, houses compared to Toronto, I think. <laughs> Okay, so the easiest way to load a data set is actually uh, using this import data set function here. And because this is a CSV file, it's actually a, a text-based file. So I'm gonna use the read R function, click on that. And then you navigate to over here, you say browse and you navigate to the data set itself. So I have my data set here. Data visualization, uh, intro to R, data, blah, 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 and then click on it. And then once you do that, it'll show you some preview. Looks good for the most part. You can actually click on it and say skip or assign a different type of data to it. So maybe it's time data, date data, whatever. And then you can click import and it'll import the data set. But what I actually like to do is I copy this, uh, this script here and I paste it into my script so that I don't have to redo this every single time. So I'll take that and then I'll copy it here, for example. So I already did that. So we have the library function and then, we'll, and then we have the actual, uh, we have the actual uh, file here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this part so this was from the import function. I'm going to take this part and I'm just going to assign it to call it house, uh, just because I don't want to type this entire name out every single time. It's really long. So here you can see read CSV and it's reading the file from this location uh, in my on my desktop. So I'm going to I'm going to first off uh, run this package. So sometimes. Uh, the package actually isn't installed. So what you have to do is actually do install packages, install that, that packages. Once it's installed, it just means it's downloaded on your computer and then you actually have to load it every single time still. So if you run the read R package, uh, there's a bunch of dependencies. So I'm actually not gonna do that because it'll take like a few minutes. Um, I always say also, if you want to look cool, just go to uh, Starbucks and just run a just install a bunch of packages because it just looks really cool. Okay, so we're going to run a uh, read R. I already have the library installed, so it's all good. And then I'm going to run this, uh, load this file here. So I'm just going to click on it and then click run. And now you can see here data house has 14, 60 observations and 81 variables. Then you can click this button here to view it, or there's a view function. So capital V house, and then you run it. 
and you can see the data here. Now resize the window, check it out, whatever. You can sort it high to low. Okay. And then uh, we're going to jump right into some very simple data manipulation techniques. So first off, head and tail. Head basically just pulls the first, I think, six rows of the data set. So I'm just going to do head. So you can see it here is the first six rows. And then the tail does the same thing, the bottom six rows. I think you can also say like first 10 rows. Yeah. I'll just take that off. And then uh, we use the dollar sign to call a variable. Okay. So what that means is if I do house, so that's the data set. Actually, if you do H O U, you can see uh, our studio automatically tells you, oh, is this what you're looking for? So it's a kind of like autocomplete in Google. And if you do dollar sign, then you can see all the variables or columns in that data set. So in this case, I want to do sales price. So I can click on it. Then it'll just give you a list, you know, highest to lowest, the uh, sales, not the highest to lowest, the uh, number one index to later on, right? So the first price is 208, 181. So you can go see it here. 208181 and so on. So this basically just pulls this entire column. Oh, it's tripping out. There we go. Okay, so uh, house. So square brackets uh, calls a specific position in that data set. So rows and columns. So what this does is it call, it's calling row 10, column 5. So if you do that, then it's it'll tell you it's a lot area and then the actual data is 7420. So you can go and actually you can kind of check if you want, right? So row 10 lot area uh, 7420. Yeah, so ID 10, not row number 10 because there's a first row is the, the name. Okay, and then you can also do just the a uh, row, for example, so row number nine. So, or you can say, hey, combination of the variable and then the number 10 in that list. Right, so this one calls uh, the lot area and then number 10, so it's the same number here. Uh, this is the uh, the link actually to that, that data file on, online, if you want to check it out. Okay, and then some something I always do to the data set, uh, probably the first thing I always run is the summary function. So I do a summary and I just check all the variables. It tells you minimum, mean, maximum, and so on. So I kind of just look through it. Uh, and then you can do with the column names, which is the variable names. So, so this is just a list of all the variable names. I also gave you the data fields uh, Word doc. So it actually tells you every single variable and what, what it's for. Okay, and then I'll go back, see if there's any questions. Um, uh, oh, there's a lot more. Is there a shortcut to run lines from R without manually moving the mouse to the R, the run button. Yeah, so control enter is how I do it. There's actually a bunch of short keys you can look at. Oh, yeah, Pam answer that. Uh, or command if you're on Mac, yep. Uh, Angeli getting an error. Um, yeah, so I can I can maybe I'll take a look afterwards. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't see your screen, so it's hard for me to tell what's happening. Uh, shouldn't the 11th row and sixth column since it's indexing starting from zero? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, the index starting from one, so I think that's right. Uh, 10 through 5th column, cool, okay. Do we do that? Yeah, we did that already. Oh, scroll too much. Okay, so the next function we're gonna look at is called plot. Uh, it does exactly what you think it's gonna do. So plot, and then you have to put in your X and Y variables. So let's say in this case, I want to look at area 
and price in a scatter plot. So I'm just going to run that. And you can see the visualization will pop up. So a quick question here I always ask is, hey, is there a relationship, do you think, between lot area and price? So does the increase in lot area increase the price? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, so a lot of people, I think, um, will look at this and say, hey, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of relationship because there's a couple of these outliers here, right? Uh, but it does kind of look like there's a sort of a positive, positive trend. So we'll, we'll dig a little bit about into that in a bit. Now you can actually also add some more parameters. So you see same function, we're plotting lot area and sales price, but now I have this main param parameter, which is the main title, sales price versus lot area, colors equals red. So if you run this, now it's got a title and the colors equals red. So nothing crazy. If you actually do, uh, let me just copy this plot and then if you go comma and you do tab it'll actually give you all the uh, parameters that you you can use in this so you can do x and y limits which limits the the axes main main title subtitle x lab right so there's a description for all of this label for x axes and so on uh, and there's a ton of these and you uh, and we talked about this before, but you can also do the question mark plot, uh, and then you can do the generic x and y plotting. So different arguments, and you can see the type uh, p for points, l for line, b for both, uh, s for steps, h for histogram. So. Let's try L for lines, see what happens. Type equals L. Object, oh, so we gotta do a quotation mark. Oh, yeah, that doesn't look very good. <laughs> so I probably wouldn't do lines. Points make sense. But you get the point. Uh, just, you can you can dig into, customize customize this however you want. And then we have uh, the correlation function, the core function. So what is a correlation? It is essentially how two variables uh, move, uh, whether they move together or not. And it's a it spits out a correlation coefficient that goes from the range of negative one to one. Uh, zero being there's no relationship. Uh, one being there's a direct relationship they're actually the exact same data, positive. So if one goes up, the other one goes up. So in this case, right, if lot goes up, prices probably go up. That makes sense. Bigger the house or bigger the size of the, the lot area, the, the more expensive the house is. So if you run a correlation here, then it's 26%, which is kind of high, but not really, um, right? So in this case, generally, I would say, and we'll have, probably have to dig a little bit deeper into it. If we go back to our plot, right? There you go. Okay, so if we go back to our plot, you can kind of see like, hey, maybe there's some relationship in here. So how do we take all these outliers? So one way we could do that is we can create a second data set that limits the data from 50,000 and below, right? So then I'm gonna create a new data set called house clean. So it's just like clean data. And I'm gonna use a square bracket I'm going to use the function which uh, house lot area is less than 50,000. So lot area is less than 50,000. And then comma, and then I'm going to leave that blank because I'm going to take all the columns. So what this does is I'm taking the same data set, but I'm going to create a, a subset of it that only has lot area under 50,000. So then when I do this, you can see here house clean, there's only now 11 less observations. So probably all these 
all these ones, but send them our variables. So that looks right. So then if you plot that, hey, now it's like more zoomed in and you can kind of see, hey, there kind of does look like there is a, a positive relationship. And then when you run the correlation on this, now I can say, hey, okay, it's 38%. Now that's a little bit, little bit better. Uh, okay. Um, ooh. Got some questions. David, how do I rename the data set to house? Uh, it was done on assignment when he imported from the read function. If you import it under a different name, then you can reassign it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you pull out houses less than 50K from data, Gary? Uh, yes. So houses less than uh, 50. 50,000 in terms of lot area. And I think it's in square footage. Great. I'm just going to check if I miss any questions. All right. Looks good. Okay. Moving on. So usually here, um, actually, usually all throughout between, we we'll, would we'll run exercises, but uh, I'm going to leave that till the end just in case uh, some people are not following along, we can kind of just run through the basics first. So I'm just trying a bunch of different plots. All right, so let's create a new variable. That's always fun. Um, essentially how you do that is you can assign a new variable name to it. So let's say we want age. And how would you uh, do, how would you create a new column? That's the age of the house. Give me a second to think about that. All right, so the age, um, there is a variable called, uh, I think the age, uh, sorry, the year it was built, the, the building was built. So year built. So what you would do then is you can say current year, which is 2020 minus the years built. And that would be your age, nothing crazy. Oh, I made this code in 2020. <laughs> um, yep, yeah, so uh, you can do house clean dollar sign age and then you assign 2020 minus the years built. So then when you run this, now you can see here now is 82 variables. And if you go look at the data, you can go see on the last, uh, oh, there we go. In the uh, last column, I gotta go to the next page. There we go. There's a new variable called age and we just built that. And a quick way to check, right? So the first row, the age is 17. The years built is 2003. So yeah, that, that math checks out. Uh, and then, you know, we can potentially look at, for example, uh, the age of the house to the price. So here you can see, hey, the more, the older the, the house is, is, the cheaper the price. So that makes a lot of sense. Okay, and then the last section we're gonna do before we close it off, uh, we're gonna run through the most basic questions fairly quickly. So first off, averages. Uh, there's three main types of averages, mean, median, mode. Um, there's actually, I think, like 10 other types, but we won't go into it. These are the three main ones. So mean of the house price, 180K, makes sense. Median, 163K. Median is the number that's in the middle when you line it up from lowest to highest. And then mode is the number that appears the most. I don't think I've ever heard anyone use the mode except in like high school statistics. Uh, never, never seen anyone use this. <laughs> but if you run the mode, you can see it actually spits out numeric. So what does that mean? So you look into it and you're like, oh, it's a storage mode of an object. So that's not what we want, right? 
So there is actually no function for mode. So then it's like, oh, okay, I'm scratching my head. I actually need to figure out the mode and I don't know how to, how to get that. So I'm gonna go to my trusty old friend Google and I'm gonna say mode in R. And you're looking at it and then see the first link here. And then I scroll, 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 different, different options, trim, NA, median, mode. Oh, okay. Create the function. All right. So you have to create a new function. So luckily this guy already did it for us, this guy or girl. So we're going to take this, copy it, and then put it into our code. So I already did that here. You run that. So now the function exists. So you have get mode as a function. Then what you do is you do get mode and then the house price. And now you get the price. That's a, uh, <laughs> actually, uh, my friend who's a programmer jokes. Um, any, any really good programmer, they're just really good at Googling how to find the right answers. Um, obviously, you know, um, you can't remember all these different functions and intricacies. So as long as you know how to solve the problems in general, it's not too hard to find the specifics of the tools that you need to solve a specific problem. Minimax. That one's uh, simple enough. And then standard deviation. Just a note, uh, what is standard deviation? Standard deviation, it is the average of how far your data is from the average, right? So what does that mean, Eric? If you go to, I'm just gonna pop that out. How's do law area house sales price. All right, so if you look at this, the average for the sales price is gonna be let me say it was before like 180k. Yeah. So 180k, which is about here, I think. All right. So on average, how far it's the average is going to be a horizontal line here. So on the average, how far are each individual dots away from that line? So you do this dot minus the line, this dot minus the line, and you take all of them and you average it. So we use that a lot for risk assessment or variance, uh, understanding variance. All right, and then going a little bit more advanced, uh, installing packages. So first off, um, let's talk about packages. So we talked a little bit about packages in read our function earlier on, but now I'll do a little bit more in depth. So there's this package called psych, which is a package for psychologists. So if you Google psych package in R, you can go to this crane. So crane is where all the packages are stored. I mean, you can find other packages that's like third party um, and install those, but the crane is like the official ones. It's vetted by a lot of university professors and there's a whole committee of volunteers that looks at it. But essentially for the psych package, you can see 430, 430 pages. This is like very well documented. Inside these packages, there's a bunch of, whoops, uh, functions you can use. So if you go down to the one we want to look at, so all these are uh, functions you can use. So I say I want to use this function called describe. I can go here and you'll actually talk about, okay, the describe function, basic descriptive statistics useful for psycho psychometrics, blah, 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 usage. So describe and then all the different parameters, all the arguments that can go into it, the details, and a bunch of <laughs> There's a bunch of math involved. The value I spits out. Data frame of the relevant statistics. So then let's say we install this package. You'll see the magic that happens when you install a package. It does this whole situation. And then you can load the package. Okay, and then now you are able to use the describe function. So now I'm going to use the describe function on house. And see, you can hear, you can see here, um, it actually pulls up all the important statistics for every single variable. 
So everything we just did in the past, you know, 45 minutes can be done using this one function, right? So uh, law area, we have variable number five, number of variables, mean, standard deviation, median, mad, uh, min, max, there's a bunch of other statistics. And then you have to scroll down a little bit, range, skew, curtoys, standard error. So uh, that really kind of just shows the power of, um, of uh, analytics and using R. And I'm actually going to end it off there because we are just about time. We didn't really get into regression, um, but um, we'll probably do another class on using regressions and doing predictive modeling. So I'll just end it off there. I'll sh stop sharing my screen, but I uh, just want to say thank you all very much for participating. Uh, thank you for the lively questions. And uh, if you could please rate us uh, on Google or Facebook, uh, chat with us if you have any analytics questions. Um, there's a whole kind of suite of education we also offer on our website, so check those out. But I will stay back until 8.30 for any questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Hunan, general question about data sets. Are they allowed to have no values in their sales? Uh, yes. They'll just show up as NA. Would the lack of data in space be a blank cell or NA? It depends how the data is read. It could be both, uh, either. Uh, this helps make R not so seem intimidating. Yeah, no, that's, that's the whole point. When will you be doing something for regression? Not sure. Uh, we will be scheduling one. If not, next month, uh, a month or two after that. But we also have a lot, like like I said, there's the online courses. So you can check those out if you're in a hurry. Uh, yes, Jason, you will get instructions on the certificate. Uh, for a business end user from Ian, what are some advantage of using R over saying analysis that's possible in Excel? So I always tell people like, use whatever tool you feel the most comfortable with that you can solve the problem. Um, Excel has a lot of limitations, but I would say like 95% of analytics that's done in the real world is probably still in Excel. Uh, because it's the most flexible analytics tool that exists. Um, but any, I would say anything to do with large data sets, uh, anything uh, that's more than like a few thousand rows, I would probably try to do in in R. I mean, you can you can do it in Excel, but it's it'll, it'll get a little bit cumbersome. And then. Um, Really, Excel, you can only work with, Excel has its pros, like Excel is actually better at like optimization and simulation better, I think better than R, uh, but you can, run, you, you can run regressions in Excel, but it's actually really, really annoying. Um, you have to like do the add-on and it's like very, um, what do you call it? Very interface he heavy. Whereas in R, if you write the code, you can reapply it and it's very automated. When I created the age variable, it was not called age, it was V1. Any thoughts on why? Um, yeah, I think, uh, sir, I'm not sure what your name is because it's abbreviated. Uh, C. Krishnan Newman. Um, so V1 is like the uh, standard defined variable if you didn't assign a variable name to the whatever variable you're creating. So that, there might be some issues on when you're naming the variable, either you maybe missed it or didn't put the dollar sign in the right places. Um, another possible thing is like actually when you're loading in the data itself, the data actually then recognize the names of all the variables and sometimes it gets turned to v1, v2. Hunan, to add to Ian's question, uh, in a professional setting, 
would large data sets be fine through Excel or use of a database be required? So I talk about this at the beginning, right? So what is a large data set? If you can't really handle it on Excel, so anything over like 500 megabytes, I think the limitation on Excel is like 1.8 million rows. So anything more than that you can you can use on Excel. And then any sort of multi-variable analysis, you also can really do on Excel. So like if you have two different tables, it would be uh, super annoying to try to join them together in Excel. You have to use some sort of programming language to do it. Uh, I come in here, I find Excel very limiting since moving to R there is my power and it's much faster, more power, I guess. Yes, running in regression in Excel is very annoying. Cool, thanks for all the questions, everyone. Ian, question. What would you recommend as a next step, someone who's interested in further building their data analytics and science background? All right, so there's two school of thoughts. There is one where it says, if you wanna be a professional, professional analytics person, then you should probably like do some sort of a more formalized education for it. Particularly in our field, it's full of people with very high education. It's There's a bit of a education inflation in the data science field because a lot of scientists, when they join the workforce and they decided not to be a scientist, their skill sets revolves around data analysis. So there's a lot of like PhDs, data scientists, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're uh, really good at analyzing uh, more business uh, uses of data. On the other side, um, I think there's actually a ton of opportunity, especially if you're not going to be an analytics professional, maybe you're um, working in nonprofits and you wanna use analytics in your day-to-day -day work, then I would say a lot of self-learning uh, can actually be useful. So you can learn R within a month, I would say, and be pretty dangerous with it. You can learn BI tools, uh, you can learn Excel modeling. Um, and there's like very, there's also very industry specific ways to solving problems. So you, you'll have to kind of learn those things, but you don't necessarily need a higher education to, uh, to be good at uh, solving problems. As you can see, you know, we were using R for half an hour and I would say you can probably do most of your business world uh, analysis through these the combination of these functions. Um, and then beyond that, um, I would just kind of encourage everyone, you know, education is really the best way to gain analytical skills and uh, practice with uh, with your own data set uh, because it's a, it's a lot of fun. What would you recommend further for developing proficiency in R, I come from HTML and CSS background. Yeah, so I would say there's a couple of disciplines you can get into specifically for R. So you can get into the programming aspect of it, which consists of more technical things like building out uh, functions and doing your programming type of things. You can also dig into more statistics heavy things using R. You can go into prediction and data science using R. Uh, you can do specific industry uses of R. So there's a whole course on R with finance, R with economics, R with um, nonprofit analytics. So I would say figure out like there's two ways right there figure out what you want to do with it and then figure out what people need you to do and then that's always a good kind of in between to try to figure out whatever the overlap is is where you should be because that's um where you're interested and where people will pay you to do stuff <laughs> ian uh, is 
are a solid tool for cleaning up data sets. Oh, uh, this actually is similar, uh, related to question from Hunan, which is um, there's also a whole backend side of R, so like data engineering, data, data manip manipulation, data cleaning. So R is actually really good at cleaning up data set, I would say. Um, the errorness and inconsistent data values. Yep, so R is really good for it, I would say. Um, there are some thoughts, so, so people have, I've heard people say like SAS, so SAS is a better tool for data cleaning. I'm not sure if I agree with that, but it's a, maybe more of a preference point if you get to the higher level, like philosophical of uh, the syntax of the programming languages, different programming languages. But R is really good for data manipulation. We do a lot of data pipeline and data engineering in R and Python in R shop. Would you say an unrelated undergrad degree is insufficient if you want to dive into research and analytics, or would it be fine to have external qualification, for example, learning languages or building a portfolio, or is there a gate in industry from starting a related master's degree? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a hard question to answer. Um, because it's complicated. I mean, I, 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 there's a lot of things I can say about that. So first off, and back to my previous point, there is a lot of education inflation in the data science world, not because that's what people are looking for, but because there's a lot of scientists that has masters and PhD degrees that when they graduate, you know, they don't know what to do with a PhD in psychology and they don't want to go into being a professor, then they end up in industry. And most of the time they're doing an analysis of some sort or, or research. So there is there is a high level of education inflation in the data science world. That being said, I don't think if you want to be an analytics person, you need to do a higher level of education on it, especially if you're very studious. So I have certainly seen people who are self-taught. I, I know I know a, a lawyer actually, and it's like kind of funny because a lawyer is like the opposite of the spectrum. I know a lawyer who actually is really good at using R and he was self-taught and he had to because you know in his you know, little practice, they needed someone to crunch numbers and he was interested in it, he learned it, and he was really good at it. Um, and it doesn't take a whole lot of time to learn. If you want to become an analytics professional, yeah, because a lot of people who are competing for those jobs are people generally with some sort of higher education. It is a little bit more difficult. But you know, if you go to the US, for example, you can certainly find a lot of examples um, because there's more demand there for data scientists in Canada, unfortunately. You can see a lot more people without a data science specific degree, but you know if they have some sort of unrelated degree and they have a, a proof and ex proof of experience using analytics, like building up a portfolio, then um, you know they can certainly find jobs. Like the most important thing, for example, I would look at is you know, your, your ability to problem solve, but also if you have a portfolio. So if anyone here want to get a job in analytics, uh, having a portfolio is really, really important. I think of the thousands and thousands of resumes that we get, like I really get any portfolios, even just like a report, like a five page report on some data sets would be helpful. And I'm sure everyone has it too. It's just cleaning it up so it's presentable. Hope that answers part of your question. <laughs> is it fine if the portfolios are on GitHub? Of course it's fine. But you gotta make sure, depending on who you're talking to, some people might not know might not know how to use Git GitHub, but will still want to see your portfolio. Excuse me. So if you wanna it's easier if you just send it to them in a PDF. <laughs> but if you wanna go for something a lot more technical, then yeah, you the expectation is they will not know how to use GitHub. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I think I'll end it off there. Thank you everybody for joining.
it was very nice chatting with uh with you and uh we hope to see you in future classes bye